Hello and good morning. This is Jamie from Stonemaier Games, and I'm happy to be here with you after missing last week. So last week I was at a family reunion in North Carolina with 35 family members, lots of great family time and food and games and outside time. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, I just sent out this month's e-newsletter, so I'm, I'm going to have that up on my other screen over here. Let me pull that up so I have it handy. There we go. And so I'll be talking about some of the things in this e-newsletter today. Feel free to uh, to look at it if you have it accessible to you right now. I've included a link in the description of this video for you to check out. Um, let's start out with the chocolate of the day because I didn't have a chocolate of the day last week. I have really been enjoying chocolate from chocolate, chocolate, chocolate here in St. Louis. We had the pleasure of visiting with uh, Cynthia from Meeple Source and her, um, her partner Richard. They stopped by St. Louis before the family reunion, so almost two weeks ago now. And we just had a, a wonderful stroll through the neighborhood with them. And they had stopped by this chocolate, chocolate, chocolate place in St. Louis. I'd had their chocolate before, but I never actually visited their location. Still haven't. And, but they gave us some of the chocolate and we've really been enjoying it. So that's my chocolate of the day today. What is your favorite local chocolate place? If you, if you enjoy chocolate and you have a local cho a, a chocolate factory or, or place local to you, let me know what your favorite is in the comments here. Carlos has a question right off the bat. He says, his wife and him have been enjoying Viticulture World immensely. She doesn't like cooperative games, but she fell in love with this expansion as the variety that comes from each continent and also the variety from the initial setup makes her play in different ways. Oh, I thought there was a question here. Carlos is just saying nice things about Viticulture World. He says, it's now a preferred way to play Viticulture with two players. That's great to hear, Carlos. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, Viticulture World um, had the retail release uh, what, last week, maybe the week before, June, July 22nd, I believe it was. So that's one of the, actually, the bits of news in the e-newsletter today, that Viticulture World is is available from your local retailer. And if it isn't, if you go there and you can't find it, um, the first thing to do would be to request it from that retailer. Um, the second thing would be to do, if they, if they say, oh, we can't get it, um, you might ask them why. And I think many retailers, or some retailers might say, Oh, Stonemaier Games only sells through GTS distribution, which we don't buy from. This is at least in the U.S. And that is true. We do sell to hobby game stores through GTS uh, uh, distribution, but we also sell directly to retailers to serve those who work with other distributors. And that's kind of a, a misconception we're finding with some stores right now who are a little confused about how they get our games. So, um you probably don't want to go that deep with your retailer, but if you really want your retailer to carry our games and our products like Viticulture World and you don't see that happening, feel free to ask them or uh, talk to us about it and we can reach out to that retailer and find out what's going on because we really want to serve all of you um, and get our games to you in the way that you want to buy them, whether it's directly from us, from an online retailer, local retailer, however you get our games. Um, we are, we're here to serve you. Let's see. Uh, Carlos has a, so I, I won't answer spoiler questions here, and I don't typically answer questions about code names, Carlos. So Carlos does have a question about one of the code names that you'll find in our e-newsletter, but I don't usually discuss what they are. I can talk about the general chart, like the, the, how the, the structure of the chart works in general. Let's see if I can answer that. Um, uh, so Carlos, uh, Carlos, I'll answer your question in general. Carlos is asking about theme in games. Do we, do we apply themes to games after the games are already designed and developed. And no, we, we work on games, all of the games that we work on are designed with a theme in mind from the ground up. So the theme and the mechanisms go hand in hand from the very inception of the game. Um, whether I'm the designer or there's another designer for the game, it's not something we slap on at the end of the process. Theme and mechanisms are part of the core design process from the very beginning for all of our games. So one of the big reveals in today's e-newsletter, we don't have any, any like really big stuff today. I do talk about Gen Con, I'll talk about that in a second. But I did reveal the second spoiler card for Wingspan Asia. This is the next expansion for Wingspan. Let's see if I can get this to focus a little bit so you can see it. Um, it's not really focusing here, but this is the Red Crowned Crane. Um, this card has a little bit of a story behind it, but let me show you what's on the card first. It's worth five points. It can hold two eggs. Uh, it's, it's a little bit expensive to play and involves three resources. It can only be played in the water habitat. And the text of the card says, when played, score one of your bonus cards now by cashing one of any resource from the supply on this bird for each point. So you're scoring a bonus card right away and you're using, um, you're using uh, the, the food tokens to track how many points you get because there's no other way to track points during the game. Uh, 
discard that bonus card and draw a new one. So this is really cool. I don't think we've seen this in Wingspan before where you're actually scoring, you're instantly scoring a bonus card that you have. And, uh, and in doing so, you also get another bonus card, which can be quite powerful. That can result in quite a few points. And meanwhile, you're getting five points from the Red Crown Crane alone. The little story behind this card is that uh, when Wingspan originally came out, our Chinese, uh, our Chinese localization partner asked us if they could make a promo card just for their uh, for their audience, a, a Chinese pr promo card. And at the time, we had started moving away from the concept of promo cards and things like that. And but I was like, you know, I, I don't see any harm in it. Sure, go ahead and do it. And I realized that was a big mistake, not a big mistake, but a small mistake because they printed a card that, of course, people in other languages wanted too. but it wasn't a card that Elizabeth designed. It wasn't an official card, really. It was just something they came up with. Um, I think it may, the, the ability may have even been an exact copy of another ability in the game. Uh, but people wanted it, as people do when they see something that makes their game incomplete. And so I've been looking forward to the Wingspan Asia expansion for us to put the Red Crown Crane in this expansion. And Elizabeth actually designed this card. So she didn't design the original card. Like I said, I think it was based on another card's design. But Elizabeth made a much cooler ability, I think, than the original Red Crown Crane. And so this is the official Red Crown Crane that you can find in Wingspan Asia. Now, there we go. Got to focus for a second. Um, and so if, if you ever coveted that original Chinese language Red Crown Crane, that one's no longer being printed. It's ir irrelevant to the game itself. Um, this is the official version of the Red Crown Crane. Yeah. I'll get back to Gen Con stuff in a second. Let me see if there's anything else. I kind of mentioned in the newsletter that as we get a little bit closer to the, the real full reveal of Wingspan Asia, which is still early Q4, um, I might start releasing a few more of these cards and a few of the places where I might do it. I'll end up consolidating all of them on our website. So you can always find them there. But uh, I might announce them on, on Instagram. So if you want to follow at Jamie Stegmeyer on, on Instagram, on the Stillmire Games Discord, which you can find a link to that in our e-newsletter. And um, where, where else did I say? Wingspan Facebook group and on the mill. All of those links are in the... Um, in the e-newsletter, I don't think we'll do. I, I don't think we'll do any of those this month. But I might. I might do one this month, and then next month I'll probably do a few more because I want to show that we're getting closer and closer to the release as we, or not the release, or the full announcement as we as we actually get closer to it. Let me look over at comments, and then we'll talk about Gen Con real quick. Uh, Corey has a nice comment here. Uh, uh, about some games of mine that I donated to a great cause that Corey um, volunteers his time for in, in West Virginia. So Corey, thanks for sharing that link. I'm happy to contribute some of my games um, to that to that great cause. Tony says, any little update info on the current status of your open world game? Um, all I can say right now is that I'm still having a lot of fun with the design. Um, it is a big game to design. My goal is to finish the design for that game sometime in 2022. It'll probably take to the end of the year. And that is just the initial design. I know that sounds kind of odd that I've been working on this game for so long and I haven't even finished the initial design yet, but it is such a massive open world. And sometimes it's tough for me to, for me to work on it because um, most of my time is spent running Stomire games. And so... Um, and, and I work on other projects too. So, however, that is my goal because I, I, I feel like it's kind of just been it's taken so long to get to that point and having a distinct goal for myself by the end of 2022 to get the core stuff in the game. I, I can't explain what it is yet, but there, there's just it's just a massive open world game. So that is my goal um, for my open world cooperative game that I've been working on for quite a while now. Laura says, just wanted to thank you for our signed card. So excited to get it. And when I had when I had my name on it, I was super thrilled. What are the odds? Oh, that's great, Laura. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you enjoyed that. Thank you. Josh, I, I commented on Josh's blog the other day. He says, good morning. Oh, sorry, Facebook's just scroll. Facebook's doing weird scrolly stuff today. So sorry if I get interrupted by that. Where was he? Josh said. Um, he got his physical copy of the Crowdfunder's Guide, my, my crowdfunding book. And he says the physical version is way better than the digital version. I generally agree with that as well. Although I read fiction on Kindle. I really like Kindle. Um, it's a little easier to hold. But yeah, this is the book that Josh was talking about. And the next book club session, I mentioned this in, in the newsletter. What time did I mention it? Three o'clock. 
three o'clock tomorrow. So it'll be here on the Star Games Facebook page. We'll be talking about chapter eight, which is uh, go, what do I call it? Go small to win big. Talk about, I go, I go pretty deep into strategies to use for running a crowdfunding project in this chapter. So I'm looking forward to talking about the strategies tomorrow at three o'clock central time on the Stumar Games Facebook page. And as usual, the video will be on YouTube later after that. Let's see, chat says, I noticed the dot in the lower right corner, so we're talking about the progress chart, um, is shows the expansion letter is red. Oh, oh, okay, sorry, Chad is talking about the card. Here we go, the card. He says, does this, uh, instead of gray like the previous expansions. So he's talking about this little icon down here. The reason we have color coded it is to make it easier for you to sort out uh, cards from this expansion um, from the other expansions. And that is for no particular reason other than we probably should have been doing this all along and color coding. So th this is a uh, uh, letter coded. It says um, A, just letter A for Asia. Um, but the other icons uh, that we've used to mark expansions are kind of gray. They kind of look similar. And so it's very difficult right now to easily go through your cards and separate out expansions. If you, if that's something you do, I leave all my cards shuffled together, but it, it's just to make um, cards easier to separate. And this is again, not unique to Asia. It's something that uh, we probably should have done for the other two expansions. And we will do that going forward. It's not mechanical in any way. Uh, let's see. Dominic says he likes the idea of having different places to reveal a card. Reminds me of how Magic the Gathering does it. I do like how Magic the Gathering reveals, has sends different cards to different content creators to have them re reveal it. We might do a little bit more of that in the future. Um, yeah. Uh, Carlos says, would Stillmeyer ever publish a party game? If so, would it have to follow the one to five player rule? It would have to, at least, yeah, I mean, all games that we publish have to follow that, uh, that one to five player rule. It can go above five players, but it can't, uh, uh, it can't have fewer than five players. I don't think a party game really fits into our submission guidelines. We're looking for games that are kind of the meat of game night. We focus on medium weight Euro games. Um, I think it would be highly, highly unlikely unless it was, uh, a game that somehow met those requirements that we have on our on our submission page, uh, yeah, I think I, th it would, I mean it would definitely have to meet those requirements. Uh, being a medium weight Euro game is not a requirement; it's just what we typically publish, what we're known for. Um, so I think it's unlikely. But uh, but if it really did fit all those other requirements, yeah, maybe you could you're, feel free to submit it to us. But I would say there are other companies that do specialize in that sort of thing that publish a lot of party games or at least a variety of of games in that genre. And so they might be a better target for that. We only publish one or two games a year. So we have to be really, really selective about what is best for us to focus on, what we really love spending our time focusing on and what's best for our audience. Gen Con, let's talk Gen Con. Um, that's part of the news that I have today. So Stillmire Games will semi-officially be at Gen Con. We aren't a convention focused pub publishing company, but MeepleSource, our friends at MeepleSource, for the last few years, I think we skipped the pandemic or they skipped the pandemic, maybe even last year too, um, we'll have a big booth at Gen Con that will have many of our products there, a whole team of Stillmire Games volunteers uh, to demo our products, full scheduled demos and just little demos to show you how things work. I mean, Mahir, the, the co-designer for Viticulture World will be there so you can get your copy of Viticulture World signed by Mahir if you'd like, or you can just talk to him and say hi. I'm sure he'd love to hear your thoughts or your favorite continent for Viticulture World. Um, they're in the, ex the main exhibit hall, booth 2909, 2909. That's the Meeple Source booth featuring Stone Margins products. And I mentioned the e newsletter. Some of the things that you'll find there are promos. So you'll find a bunch of promos that Meeple Source carries and that we carry that you can typically only buy online. This is an easy way to buy them in person and not have to pay for shipping. Uh, you can buy signed scythe cards there. I signed around 500, 600 uh, promo cards for Scythe. Not new cards, just existing cards that we had before. Um, I believe it's encounter card number 37 that I signed hundreds of times over and over. Uh, that will be at the booth if you want to get a signed card. I don't know if they're charging for them or if you'll get it for free just for buying something else from Evil Source. Um, I mentioned Viticulture World co-designer Mahir Shah will be there. Wingspan Art Prints by Natalia and Anna, the illustrators for Wingspan that do all these beautiful birds for Wingspan. Their art prints will be at, at uh, the Meeple Source booth. And 
the last remaining copies of the wine crate in the US will also be there and you can even reserve them. So there's a link in the newsletter where you can go reserve your copy of the wine crate. If you really wanted the viticulture wine crate um, and you didn't get it, you can get it from Meeple Source. And again, avoid having to pay for shipping. It's a big thing to ship. So it's a great chance to get it at, uh, at Gen Con. And last, oh yeah, this is the big thing. I should have led with this. We have a sample copy of the Wingspan nesting box. One of the first production copies off the print run. We sent, uh, we actually had our project manager from Panda. He brought it with him um, from Canada, I believe. And he is giving it to MeepleSource to show off at the booth. This will not have Wingspan Asia inside the box, even though the first print run of the nesting box will, because obviously it's a little bit too early to reveal that. But it will have all the other stuff for the nesting box right there for you to look through. You can see the full art on the outside of the box, on the inside of the box, all the different containers. Um, that is there. And for that reason, if you also go to the nesting box page on our website right now, you can see for the first time a 3D image of certain, or of the nesting box. You'll see two birds that are on the nesting box from the angle that we chose for the 3D box image. But this is the big thing I'm really excited about. That this is like this is the first place for you to see the nesting box in person or at all really. See all the stuff um, if you go to the Maple Source booth at Gen Con. Go check it out. And I, I'm obviously I'm not at Gen Con. I'm missing out. So if you take any photos at Gen Con, I'd love to hear. I'd love to see your photos. Post them or tag me at uh, Jamie Stegmaier on Instagram. I'll share them. I want to see them. I want to see what's going on. Uh, what you're excited about at Gen Con as it relates to Stillmeyer Games and in general, but tag me if it's related to Stillmeyer Games. Beverly says um, she's new to Stillmeyer Games, her first wingspan, second viticulture. She loves both. She's played viticulture around eight times now, and I envision, envisioned a new game. With playing, round, with playing rounds being one year, I could see a similar game called Apiculture. She says, I'm a beekeeper and I can see all sorts of things that parallel the structure of viticulture. Has anyone else made a suggestion like this? Thank you, Beverly, for sharing that idea. I appreciate that uh, Viticulture got your creative juices flowing as it relates to bees. Um, and I like the name, uh, Apiculture, Apiculture. Um, so a couple of things there. We, we have, or we did consider uh, creating a sequel for Viticulture at one point. I was looking at a chocolate theme because I love chocolate and there are many kind of step-by-step -step stages to the chocolate making process. But since then, since having that idea, um, some chocolate themed games that kind of do that step-by-step process have already come out. In terms of bee themed games, if you like bee themed games and worker placement, I'd highly recommend Honey Buzz. Honey Buzz is a great game from uh, a friend of mine here in St. Louis uh, that, uh, that I have on my shelf over here. I love Honey Buzz, it has beautiful art, beautiful components, great worker placement and great engine building to it. Um, I'd recommend checking that out if you like, um, if you like bees as, you, as it sounds like you do and you like Viticulture's worker placement. Tony says, uh, he says, surprised at yesterday's announcement that DC and HBO Max scrapped their Batgirl film after it was totally completed and won't release it due to poor test audience reactions. With that in mind, what was the furthest you've ever gone into game design development and then scrapped the entire thing? Yeah, this was an interesting announcement. Um, they would put all that time and effort and money into a uh, into a movie and then just decide not to do anything with it. Like they could literally, literally put it on HBO Max with no paying no advertising at all and just put it up there and see what happens. They could do that, but I'm guessing that maybe they they think it would hurt the the brand. I guess the ongoing movie DC movie brand. Uh, the lo the longest I've gone into a game design. Uh, it actually wasn't my design. It was, a, it was a game that we worked on that I'm still hoping to make in some form someday, but it was an idea for a game I had. And I went to some designers and I said, I love this idea. Uh, here are kind of the initial things that I've, I've played around with a little bit. Would you want to run with this and try to design this game? And I had an artist working on it at the same time. So we had this art, this world building um, and the game being designed. And over multiple designs, the game just never tested well enough for us to say, let's go ahead and publish it. Like it got fine results. People thought it was fine. Um, they didn't hate it, but they didn't definitely didn't love it. And this was over multiple designs. And after several of them, the designers just decided they didn't want to work on it anymore. Um, and so that game, and I, I don't have time to work on it right now because I, I usually have two games in the wor works. So I think I will, after I work, finish up my open world game, I should be able to focus on this game a little bit. Um, I'm hoping to. Uh, yeah, so that's I mean, so it isn't completely scrapped, but it was definitely put on hold for 
several years now, really, where there was a finished version of the game, essentially, and uh, but it just wasn't good enough. And I, I don't want to publish a game that, that isn't good enough for you. You all deserve the best from us. So um, that game is set aside for now. Chad says, it's great that you have such a good relationship with Source. How did that relationship start? That's a great question, Chad. Um, how did it start? I know that I met Cynthia. She stopped by a little table that we reserved at Gen Con back in maybe 2015. It was a long time ago. And we just had a great time talking to, to Cynthia. I think Richard stopped by then too. So I get to hang out with Richard. Richard isn't officially part of Source, but he's, uh, he's Cynthia's partner. He's a great guy. And so it, it, uh, it was great to meet them both basically at, at Gen Con way back in the day. And I think at the time, um, we started talking about the idea that we had all these promos for our games. At the time, we had more promos than we did now, especially with Scythe. We had lots of promos for Scythe, little card promos. And we didn't have a good way of shipping them because, I don't know, it's, it's one thing for our fulfillment centers to ship a, a big box, you know, a box, a, a game, a, an expansion. But it's another thing for them to pull a lot of different promos from a lot of different boxes. I think it's a different skill set, a different logistics process to ship a lot of small things opposed to one or two bigger things. And Meeple Source is really good at that. Like that's what Meeple Source does. They, they they do make custom meeples, but they also are just very good at shipping a lot of little things. And so it was some point around that time that we we realized that and said, would you want to carry our promos? Would you want to be the essentially the, the retailer for our promos. And eventually they became a little bit of a distributor for some of our promos. They sell some of them to retailers. Um, and Meeple Source also makes uh, Stonemaier specific products. Uh, they're not a, like any third party accessory. They're not official Stonemaier products, but they like special Meeples for our games, things like that. Um, so they have those, but they also have like things that we made that we sell through them. Um, yeah, and it's just been it's been a really really fruitful relationship. They're they're wonderful people to work with. Cynthia and Chris really, it's a brother sister that uh, that we work with. I don't know if I met Chris um, in 2015 or 2014, whenever uh, I met Cynthia at Gen Con, but uh, it's a brother sister team, and they they it's, it's really neat to see what they've what they built at, at Meeple Source, and really great to have that partnership. Michelle says I've taken her son, I've taken. Her son, not my son, uh, it's a Six Flags St. Louis, I don't have a son, several times this summer. It's been his first experience with large thrill rides, and so far he likes them. Do you enjoy roller coasters? That's a fun question, Michelle. Um, I'd love to hear from anyone in the comments. How do you feel about roller coasters? Um, I have not ridden a roller coaster in a long time, and I would say as a kid, up through my teenage years, I was I was scared of them. I didn't like how they made my stomach feel when they, when they go down. I, I, I really didn't like that feeling. And then in high school, I just decided I want to get over this. I want to I want to try to have fun on a roller coaster. And so I went into it. And this is a good I don't know good reminder to me to say this out loud because I, I think sometimes I I find something to be not fun and I I stop trying to give it a chance to be fun. But this I went into it with a mentality I want to make roller coasters fun. I want to do I want I would, I, would, I just want to embrace the fun of a roller coaster. And so I. I just I went with some friends who who really really funny friends and and we just we just did it we in high school we just rode some roller coasters and uh, and I had a blast with it for the first time ever like it was such a different experience than the little roller coasters I'd experienced before and where I'd approach them with fear instead of um, instead of joy instead of going into it wanting to have fun with it there's a long answer for it Michelle but I would not say that I actively seek out roller coasters now. But given the opportunity to ride a roller, co roller coaster, I would gladly do so now. I know how to have fun with them, uh, opposed to approaching them with, with fear and, and, and how I know my stomach will feel when I do it. Um, and that made a big difference. I don't know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would gladly ride a roller coaster, but I wouldn't actively seek it out. I haven't been to an amusement park um, in many years. The one that I want to go to, I think someday, when I feel that it's appropriate for COVID is to go to the Star Wars immersive experience um, at uh, Disney World or Disneyland. I'm not sure which one has it. I love the idea of that, of kind of feeling like I am part of the Star Wars world for a couple days. Uh, I, I, I really want to do that. Um, I've heard kind of mixed reviews so far. So I'm curious if anyone has actually done that. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Have, have you done the full immersive Star Wars experience at uh, Disney World or Disneyland? And what did you think about it? Or if you've just gone to kind of the general Star Wars stuff that they have there, what did you think about that? Do you think it's worth going?
Ryan says he wants to hear more about the open world game. I, I haven't revealed details about the game, um, but for a long time now, I've been working on a fully cooperative, massive open world game that does something. Um, so there are some great open world games that have come out that I really enjoy. Sleeping Gods is on my shelf over here. I love Sleeping Gods, but uh, my game does something visually different than these games uh, to immerse players in the world. Uh, it does, does a lot of things different. Um, that have also been design challenges that, that kind of expanded the world to, to a certain size that uh, has just taken a long time. But I look forward to talking about it. Hopefully, uh, I can start talking about it. Probably in, It'll probably be 2024 when this game will be released, if all goes well, sometime in 2024. So we'll, hopefully that will happen. Um, I see some more questions here. Let me look over at the e-newsletter to see what I haven't talked about yet. So back in stock stuff. We do have some stuff back in stock this month. We have... Uh, some disc golf discs back in stock, including two new disc golf discs, the Between Two Trees disc and the Brute, inspired by Libertalia. I've thrown the Brute recently. It's awesome. It's a really cool disc. I haven't actually thrown the Between Two Trees disc yet, but Megan was doing some cool stuff with it uh, when we played this past Sunday. Um, actually, speaking of disc golf, I got to play. I was in the last week. I was at a family reunion in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. It's a it's a little island uh, off the coast of North Carolina. And I found that they had, or my cousin found that they have a disc golf course there. And so we played disc golf twice at the Outer Banks. I'd highly recommend the course there. I can't remember the name. I think there's only one course there, but it was actually a really, really good course on the Outer Banks um, that I really enjoyed. And uh, games I played with my family at, at uh, the family reunion, we played So Clover, played F Fantasy Realms, Ticket to Ride Europe, Deep Sea Adventure, had the best game ever of Deep Sea Adventure, where I was playing with a bunch of people. Some of them had been drinking, some of them hadn't been drinking, came down to the last roll for uh, my mom and I. I was on a team with my mom to survive. We needed a six. We hit a six on that last roll. Everyone cheered. It was one of those stand-up cheer moments. Even though we didn't win, just like surviving um, and getting back off the boat, the last minute was, was so cool. Um, I, great, great memories of that game, Deep Sea, Deep sea Adventure, if you haven't played that. Played No Thanks and played Cartographers a few times. We also played Pickleball um, a few times, not a few times, but I, I spent a, a morning playing a number of games of Pickleball and played a lot of ladder golf. We played a lot of kind of outdoor, on the beach or outdoor games at my family reunion to the beach. Um, yeah, great time doing that. Back to back in stock stuff, we also have the Viticulture Stemless Wine Glasses are back in stock in the U.S. These are, we don't typically transport these to our other fulfillment centers because they break so easily, um, but we do have them in the U.S. My Little Scythe is back in stock, Between Two Castles of Mackin Lego is back in, back in stock, and Rolling Realms is back in stock. And speaking of Rolling Realms, um, my next playthrough will start on Friday. I'll do Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I think on Sunday... Don't hold me to this, but I'm if I think I will reveal the next uh, promo realm for uh, for uh, for Rolling Realms. I've already revealed that we're doing a feast for Odin. Actually, I shouldn't say next. I will reveal a, an upcoming promo realm for Rolling Realms this Sunday in the live playthrough. That'll be on Facebook Live and the in the Rolling Realms group, and then on uh, on YouTube later. Haven't decided entirely yet, but I'm leaning towards doing that. Yeah, we'll see. Let me go back over to questions for a second, then I'll come back to my topics in the e-newsletter. Yeah, I still do have some stuff in the e-newsletter here. Chad says, what would you say are a few of the prominent themes to the games that were submitted to Stonemaier Games? Well, Chad, honestly, I don't see a lot of the games. I'm not the first filter for submissions. Um, there's a form that people fill out. As I, I, I think you know this, Chad, but I'll, I'll say it out loud. There's a form that people fill out that explains kind of the basics of their games. And my co-founder, Alan, reads through those descriptions. He sees, A, if it even meets, meets our guidelines in the first place, and B, if it's uh, in, an intriguing theme or mechanism or the combination of the two uh, to go a step further. Um, so I don't see a lot, like that's that's that part of his job. So I, I don't see most of them. I only see the ones that get past that that filter. Uh, we will be playtesting one or two submissions next week, I believe. But I haven't, I, I don't know, I, I haven't really seen, based on the few games that I see get through past that filter, I haven't seen any patterns emerge. Steven says, the open world game was put on hold. No, the open world game is very much in process. It's just taking a long time. Definitely not on hold. Kevin says that he loves roller coasters. Jenna uh, also says she used to love them, hasn't been on one for for years, similar to, to me as well. Um, yeah, I'll let people read the answers. I, people are answering the question. Welcome to answer questions in the comments. That's, that's the place to answer them. Jenna says she'd love to see a theme park theme game from Stonemaier. Jenna, have you played 10 Penny Parks? 
I've, I've heard good things about 10 Penny Parks recently, but I haven't played it yet. But I think that is a theme park themed game. And I also have a game on my shelf of opportunity called Wishland. That's a theme park themed game that I need to play and see what I think about that. Okay, I asked if anyone has been to the Star Wars stuff at Disney World, and Jake says that Galaxy's Edge is amazing. He says the Rise of the Resistance is a fantastic ride and experience. That is awesome. Uh, and Jake, correct me if I'm wrong. That's uh, those are that's not the fully immersive part of the experience, right? The full the fully immersive thing that I'm talking about is where you kind of enter a hotel, and you kind of role play for a few days, and and it's meant to feel like you are in the Star Wars universe for real for a few days. Uh, that's the thing that I want to do someday, and I, I, I want to do those, all this other stuff too, which I think is part of that. Um, but I, and I think Cal Galaxy's Edge isn't that; it's just part of it. But correct me if I'm wrong there. Christopher says, "What is one of your most influential board gaming moments, and what made it so impactful?" Oh, that's a great question, Christopher. Um, it's hard to distill it down to moments. Um, oh, that's tough. I mean, I've been playing board games since I was, uh, and tabletop games since I was five or six years old, six, seven years old. And, and that's also when I started designing games. Um, there are definitely some early games that I played that have withstood the test of time. I still play Magic the Gathering from time to time. That's one that I played from a, a pretty young age, I think when I was maybe 12 or 13. Scotland Yard is a game that came out a long time ago. And that definitely had an impact on me. Um, I still love Scotland Yard. I think it's an excellent game. And I, while I don't remember a moment in that game specifically, um, playing it, I, I'm sure playing it and seeing what a game could be uh, uh, opposed to a, a game like, you know, a, a very simple game like Sorry. Um, playing a game like Scotland Yard and seeing what a modern game could be with the amount of agency of, available in Scotland Yard that you have full control over your choices, um, I'm sure had an impact on me. The other thing, I, I, again, I don't remember a specific moment, but I'm sure this hit me at a certain point, is that uh, when I designed games as a kid, I would spend a lot of time thinking about the game. I would write the rules. I would designed I would kind of lay out the game I would use uh, pencils paper sometimes a computer but usually it's pencils and paper design the board the cards all that stuff and then typically I would play the game exactly once and I would feel like I designed a game but every time I played it or every time I played a game for the first time I didn't take it a step further I didn't iterate I didn't design I didn't design more of it I think I only did that once with a game typically it was I, I kind of in my head I thought the design process ended that for, uh, when you played it for the first time. And I realized pretty quickly that that wasn't true, that uh, the first play of the game plays very differently than how I pictured it in my head. And it wasn't really until I pursued design as an adult that I fully embraced the idea that that's just the, the beginning of the design process. The design process is really the playtesting and iteration, not the idea, not the initial rules, not the initial layout of the game. So again, it wasn't a specific moment, but I, I think I started to fully realize that every time I played a game once for the first time, realized it didn't play the way it had in my head. And instead of pursuing it, I kind of deserted it and went on to the next thing. Um, it was some combination of that and realizing as an adult that I needed to follow through on those designs and iterate and, and refine them. Um, and that would be what, what would become what I now consider designing a board game. Tony says, I saw in one of the board game Facebook groups that someone baked Libertalia Winds of Gilchrist, Winds of Gilchrist scoring chest as cookies. Yeah, this is something I posted there. Um, this I'm glad uh, Tony posted it here. It is really amazing. Uh, Danielle from Board Game Bakes posted this video of how she made the score dials uh, for Libertalia out of cookies. And the dials actually work. You can turn the dials. You can keep score on these dials, which is amazing. Um, I was amazed that she came up with this, and that's why I shared it in the group. There's a link here. You can also check it out in the Libertalia Facebook group. Josh does recommend Ten Penny Parks here, that, a game that I had heard of but not played yet. Um, Simon says, have I played Creature Comforts yet? I have not. I have not played that, Simon, but I am very curious to play it, especially since I know that Wingspan has a little Easter egg appearance in it. George points out that the Stelmeyer Games 10-year anniversary is coming up soon, and that is correct. Next month, September, is our 10th anniversary uh, month. Uh, that was uh, marks back all the way back to 2012 when Viticulture funded on Kickstarter. And we have plenty of surprises, fun stuff planned for our anniversary month. I'm really looking forward to that. And thank you all who have been a part of uh, 
giving me this career and, and, and letting some rare games be a thing, be a company uh, for 10 years. That's amazing. Thank you so much for doing that. I can't wait till, till, to celebrate that with you next month. What else has been going on here? Um, I've been working a fair amount on tapestry civilization adjustments. There's a big thread on Board Game Geek, and I also mentioned uh, I posted a link in the newsletter to uh, the latest civilization adjustments. What we're, we're building towards doing a reprint of certain civilizations that will have the adjustments printed on the civilizations themselves, and many of these go beyond the simple adjustments that we previously made to them. So. Instead of just saying, okay, gain an extra resource or lose a resource at the beginning of the game, these are kind of tweaking the rules of the civilizations themselves um, uh, in a final way. Like this will be our, our final our final official changes to the civilizations. So we're working on that. I'd love for you to play test it. If, if you're available, if you want to play Tapestry, if you're in the mood to play Tapestry, if you do play, I would highly uh, prefer that you play with this, the adjustments and then give us data on them so we can have that data to gauge whether or not we're doing the right thing. Um, what else is going on? Podcast. Over the, in the last month, I decided to start recording my blog post, my Still Mario Games blog post. I just, I literally just read it um, in audio format, and then uh, we post that uh, that audio on the Still Mario Games podcast, which you can find on our website under news. News podcast is where you can find it. And let's see if they're up to date right now. I know I, I yeah, okay, they're back. They're they're all up to date now on our website um yeah so you if, if you prefer to listen to things rather than read them you can you can get the uh the storm hour games crowdfunding and entrepreneurship entrepreneurship blog on uh, in podcast form now talked about the, the book club tomorrow i think that's it for the um the e-newsletter yeah mainly about gen con back in stock stuff and the Red Crown Crane from Wingspan Asia. Uh, George says, any chance you can get Innova to print on a destroyer? To print on a destroyer. Um, let's see if I understand your question, George. So I think you're asking us, are you asking us to make a custom disc based on the destroyer? I think that's what it sounds like. I would say it's possible for us to do that. Um, but uh, we kind of pick and choose our custom discs as they as as we come up with new ideas and um, they all have to be kind of based on one of our games I don't know if the word destroyer specifically connects to any Stonemaier game um, so I, I don't I don't know I, I, I we don't have that in the works I can say that at, at least I'm I, and it's possible you're asking uh, it, you might be saying that Innova currently doesn't allow for custom printings on destroyers and if we could Negotiate with Innova to make that happen. That isn't something that we can do. Um, that's uh, that's entirely up to Innova. They give us a list of the discs that we can choose from, and those are the discs that we have available to, from us to make for us to make. Chad says, "Yeah, then I'm talking about the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel. It makes you feel like you're in a starship cruise. That is the thing that I wanted that I want to do. Um, I don't think it's actually a cruise ship, though, is it? Um, they just kind of mimic the experience of it, but I could be wrong about that too." Justin says, I have mechanism ideas, but I don't know how to build a game out of them. What are some ways that I can go from mecha mechanism ideas to actual game ideas using those mechanisms? Ooh, that's a tough step of the process, Justin, because it's really just trying stuff. Like, kind of finding a theme for those mechanisms, I think, will help. Um, and kind of asking yourself what make sense for this theme for these mechanisms and what makes sense for these mechanisms for the theme mashing them, them together but the actual step of creating whatever the game is and a cohesive experience is just a matter of of uh of trying some things to see if they work which i know is very vague but it's, it is a pretty vague part of the design process um one suggestion that i might put out there justin if you're struggling a little bit with how to conceive of the whole of the game is instead of designing a game um, design an expansion for an existing game so if you have some mechanical ideas that are somewhat similar or somewhat related to an existing game that you enjoy use those mechanisms to design an expansion for that game that way you don't have to create the entire construct for the game itself that already exists um, you are just applying some mechanism ideas or mechanical ideas to that game um, maybe give that a try and uh, and let me know how it goes George says, have you ever been to the UK? I, I have indeed. Yeah, I've been to uh, England, Wales, and Ireland. 
Um, he said, I remember you, you mentioned Ireland. Yeah, so I've been to Ireland. Uh, this is a, a Wales um, map on the wall there, an old Wales map. George is going to Scotland and Isle of Skye. Oh, I haven't been to Scotland um, or Isle of Skye, but yeah, I hope you have an amazing time there. I hope you get to play Isle of Skye in the Isle of Skye. Ryan says, any clarification on when in Q4 the Asia expansion is coming out? Uh, October, December is a too big a window, and that is an intentionally big window because freight shipping hasn't completed yet. So we don't know exactly when the expansion will, will arrive. Um, so it's somewhere in Q4. I, I, my plan is hopefully to announce it in, the early, in early October to kind of do the full reveal then and do the pre-order in early November. But uh, I don't know. It, it, Production and freight shipping. So production isn't even quite entirely complete yet. And then there's the whole freight shipping process, which can take between one and three months. So we don't know yet. I'm vague on purpose for that for that reason. When I know, you'll know. But uh, for now, it's just Q4. Chad says, have I been following the Clank Catacombs design diaries? The new lockpicks mechanism looks cool. You know, I haven't. I don't think there's a way to subscribe to it. And I pretty much only follow content that I can subscribe to. But I will... Uh, I'll make a note about that. Let's see, how can I find that? Do you have a link to it, Chad? A link would be awesome if you don't mind while I'm live here so I can click over because I do want to read. I love reading what Paul Paul uh, Brennan, Denon, what he says about uh, Clank. He has great insights about the Clank and Dune Imperium. and a great design diaries about that as well. Christopher says, what do you think makes a successful story within a campaign game? Um, I do have a video about this, Christopher, a little bit. I have about a, a, a video about my favorite games with written narrative. Check that out if you'd like. He says, I feel that people are often critical of the story because the story element is not as deep as, say, a video game or an RPG. The most successful story game within my circle was Sleeping Gods comparing to Breath of the Wild uh, Zelda game. That is a good question. I think the video will answer that to a certain extent, Christopher. Um, I think the key, in my opinion, is memorable moments. Uh, when Actually, it's two things, really. One, memorable moments. Two, that you don't burden a player with text. And uh, two things that I, two games that I think, or a game that I think does that really, really well is role player adventures. If you enjoyed Sleeping Gods, I'd highly recommend role player adventures. I think the uh, the writing in it is fun. There are big memorable moments in it. And, and I do think memorable moments is the key because uh, when you have a bunch of written narrative, a lot of it can, can contribute to the story. And in the moment, it can feel important. And that's, that's good. But the way that you'll look back on the game and reflect on it is, I think, defined by how memorable the moments are in the game. So having these big memorable moments that stand out, and that's what we aim for inside The Rise of Fenris. We really wanted these distinct memorable moments that are tied to not just to story elements, but also gameplay and to big reveals, big component reveals in the game itself, or in the campaign itself. So that, in my opinion, is, I think, the key to a great story-driven game um, on, on, in the, on the tabletop. YX says, uh, any reason why you choose to stream live on Facebook and not YouTube? Uh, yeah, I, I have tried to stream live on YouTube, but it never works well. Uh, for some reason, I've never gotten it to work well. It's something about, like right now when I'm, when I'm speaking, I can see my camera, I can see a live feed of my camera in real time. Like as I move my hand here, I'm seeing my hand move in real time. YouTube, on YouTube, there is a delay and it is really uh, hard to follow. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm talking to the camera, I'm looking at myself and I, 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 there's a delay. And so I see myself talking a few seconds after I'm actually talking. I've tried it multiple times on different, I've tried it on YouTube. I've tried it on platforms that stream to YouTube and I've never gotten it to work well. So it's as seamless as it is on Facebook. So that's why I stream live on Facebook live and then put the video on YouTube later. Let's see. Um, Tony says that his game group is playing Libertalia tonight. He says he doesn't have time to bake the cookies, but he'll just stack up Oreos and eat them at the end. I like that solution, Tony. Okay, George says he, he doesn't typically... So George was asking about a specific disc, if we can make a destroyer. Um, George, I appreciate the request. I'll kind of keep that in mind if we have a game that fits well for, for a destroyer. Someone above mentioned... Um, a scythe airship destroyer that we do we do already have a scythe disc um but also george feel free to try i don't know if you've tried the other long distance discs that we have but the 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 brute which is based on the beast is really awesome between two trees is based on the tl3 which is also a really great disc feel free to try them see if they they fit for your style or if they could be a fit for your style 
But I understand if you have a specific disc that you really love and you'd like the Stillmire disc in that, uh, in that shape. Zach says, do I have a pop filter? Those peas punch the bass. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, I'm probably just too close to my mic here. I have a, a mic here. Do I have a pop filter? No. Uh, here are my settings right now, if you want to correct me on my settings. Uh, but I think they're correct right now. Ryan recommends articles from Mark Rosewater on 10 things every game needs. That is a good article. I haven't, I haven't looked at that article for a long time. I should, I should do a video about that, though. Let's see if I can find that. That's an old post. Back in 2011, Mark originally posted that. I wonder if he's posted an update to it since then. Um, Michael says, uh, what is your early, your easiest combination and hardest combination in terms of getting points and managing resources for Rolling Realms? So I actually, just the other day, I filmed a video about how to teach Rolling Realms. It hasn't gone live yet. And the realms I recommended for it were Wingspan, Viticulture, and Between Two Castles. I think Between Two... Uh, so those, I think, are maybe the three easiest to teach. I would probably substitute between two cities for between two castles if you want the easiest experience. My Little Scythe also makes a combination really, really easy or easier. And Scythe itself is actually pretty nice, too, because you only necessarily need three dice or uh, six dice, sorry, to get all the stars from Scythe. So that might be in the mix as well. As for hardest, um, Libertalia Terra Mystica, definitely. Those two... Those two are very difficult, especially when combined together. And what would be the other one? Um, probably a realm that needs 10 numbers to complete it. What could that be? And between two castles does require 10 numbers to complete it. So maybe that one? Um, something with Libertalia and Terra Mystica. Not entirely sure off the top, off the top of my head. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chad. You're the best for posting the Clink Catacombs uh, design diary. Thank you for doing that. Tony says, have you been keeping up with the Orville? It's really hitting on all cylinders this season, holding out hope for a fourth season. Yeah, we actually just watched an episode last night about, um, about kind of about transgender issues and rights and uh, control, the, what rights you have over your own body. It was a fascinating episode. Obviously, at Stillmire Games, we support transgender rights. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, Megan and I were, were brought to tears at several points in the episode. A really, really great episode. I, I don't think that was the latest episode. I think there's maybe one or two left after that. And I think the uh, the finale is coming up soon, too, the season finale. But I agree, great season. More serious than pre previous seasons, but still with dashes of humor at the right times. Um, yeah. Let's see. George says, hopefully Santa Claus will bring us the Tapestry Rubber Playmat for Christmas this year. I think it will be ready in time for Christmas. I know it's in production right now. I don't think we've started freight shipping it yet, though. I'm looking around as if I find this answer somewhere in the room. I will not. Um, <laughs> the Excel Gamer says, he just got back from his trip to Alaska yesterday, and it was incredible. When, we went there earlier in the year. You went at a very different, different time of year. We went in February, um, so I'm sure it was very different there in uh in july than it was in in february but what was what was your uh your wildlife highlight did you encounter any animals that you weren't expecting to see or that you were hoping to see we saw some i don't want to say baby moose maybe teenager moose very close to our car when we were driving around and a bunch of moose kind of off the side of the highway just kind of chilling in the snow um i think that was the main wildlife that we saw oh we saw reindeer and we did uh dog sledding which was a lot of fun too we did a walk with the reindeer which was actually fascinating love doing that uh, the question he had was, what are your go-to small box games to bring with you on really big trips? I brought The Mind, Railroad, Inc., and Trails. I actually did a video about that fairly recently, so I should have a fairly quick answer for that. Um, so the games that I listed for my family reunion were, were games that I considered for this list. So I brought so Clover, Fantasy Realms, Deep Sea Adventure, No Thanks, and Cartographers. Those, uh, I think those are good smaller box games to bring on a list. And I, and I generally, for this list, I looked at games that are fairly easy to teach and play because I was thinking about bringing them, bringing these types of games to a family gathering or to a gathering of people who may not normally play games. Yeah, here I call it my favorite, my top 10 favorite small box games for big gatherings. And the games on the list were The Crew, Fantasy Realms, Deep Sea Adventure, Love Letter, 
uh, a fake artist goes to New York, Wizard, Sunday Split, Sushi Go, No Thanks, and The Mind. We actually did end up playing The Mind, too. I forgot about that. We had a fun, fun time doing that. get back to the, the comments here okay so michael says we tried the promo pack combination terra mystica libertalia and rolling realms it was super hard but enjoyable and challenging i think rolling realms is definitely the easiest of that batch but it is fun to play all three of them together um i can say that i, I already do have the combinations planned for friday so the first round of rolling realms on friday will be euphoria my little scythe and tapestry fun combination of realms i am though I, I love the combinations of realms. You know, I played Rolling Realms live 30 times now, and I have enjoyed every single time because of the variety of, of combining the different realms and the, the how the dice present interesting challenges every time you play. Uh, but I am also very interested in getting these new promo realms in the mix. I'm really excited about that. And we're now getting fairly close to, to actually having that happen. So let me recap what we talked about today as we're getting close to the end here. Oh, do I have any other topics? Um, yeah, I went to this place, this local place called Choquette. I don't know if you're in St. Louis, but this place, and I got this uh, Vietnamese coffee drink that was absolutely delicious. And so I tried to recreate it using sweetened condensed milk. It's not the same. It's tasty. But if you're in St. Louis and you happen to go to Choquette, I highly recommend their Vietnamese coffee. It is absolutely amazing. We also got some desserts from there that were also very tasty. What were the other topics I was going to cover today? Uh... Yesterday, I had a fun time. I filmed a top 10 video with Susanna, my coworker. Susanna is our retail relationship manager, and she came up with her top 10 list of games as of right now. We talked about them on a video yesterday. I don't know when that video will go live, but that was fun to do. A video in person with someone else. I've hardly ever done that for these top 10 videos. And uh, my video this past week was about my favorite games featuring cats in some way, whether cats make a big appearance, a small, a small appearance, but some way that the game features cats. Uh, blog posts were about ancient artifacts in games, or ancient is kind of in quotes. Magic the Gathering recently released some news that they found a bunch of boxes of a very old set, and they decided to include uh, cards from that set, like the actual cards, not reprints, but those actual cards in a new set that's coming up pretty soon. I thought that was really cool. Um, uh, regardless of whether or not the story is entirely true, I believe that they had these boxes and they, they maybe they set them aside for this purpose. Maybe they actually found them. Uh, I don't really care about that. I think it's just cool that they had this old thing and they decided to include it in new packs. I think that's so cool. And so I talked about that in a blog post. And I also talked about some results from an ad campaign that a company called Hackstone ran for us over the last few months. I would say the results are somewhat disappointing, um, but... Uh, but we learned from them, and it was an experiment. We didn't lose too much money on it, and uh, yeah, it was. A, I share the results. So hopefully, you can learn from them as well from an advertising perspective. And last, you may have heard that St. Louis was flooded last week. I had a bit of a surreal experience with it because last week I was in North Carolina at a family reunion, and so we left before the flooding happened, and we got back after the flooding had subsided. So it was very surreal. We, we did have some flooding in our basement. We're on the third floor, but we do have a shared basement storage locker down there. We had a little bit of flooding down there, but it was very surreal to leave a sunny St. Louis and come back to a sunny St. Louis, but hear about in the meantime, all this terrible flooding that was happening and that people are, are still recovering from here in St. Louis and definitely people in Kentucky too are still suffering from it. So my heart goes out to the people who lost things, who are continuing to to suffer through this, this uh, these trials and tribulations of the flooding. Um, but I wanted to share my perspective of it, what, what happened in relation to me, in case you heard about that and wondered what was going on in terms of St. Louis and flooding. In fact, I didn't hear anything from the warehouse. Hopefully everything's okay at the warehouse, but they didn't mention anything. So uh, the Excel Gamer was in Alaska recently asked if he saw any wildlife. He says, we did not see many animals on land, but we saw a lot of aquatic wildlife. I was in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is very far from the ocean. Um, so we didn't see any, but the Excel Gamer saw uh, otters and seals and whales in the bay. That's awesome. He was in Seward, uh, Seward Alaska for nine days. We hiked up to the Harding Ice Fields, which was, which was incredible. Um, that's awesome. I'm glad you had such a wonderful trip. And I feel like I saw some of the photos on Instagram, and they looked amazing. Really, really beautiful photos from the Excel Gamer on Instagram. Chad says, do you like boba tea? I have a, <coughs> excuse me, a local boba tea place that I can't get enough of. I'm okay with boba tea. I would say I like, I, I don't, 
like chewing my beverages. I'd rather have a milkshake if I wanted to have a thicker beverage. Um, but I do like the tea portion of it. I like milk tea a lot. Uh, I just don't excited. About, I, I don't get excited about the tapioca por portion of it. Let's see. Uh, Dominic has a uh, comment about Brass Birmingham. Not a Stillmeyer game, but I'm glad you're having fun with that, Dominic. Um, and Nathan says, what's been my favorite Marvel dice thrown hero to play as or against? Nathan really likes Captain Marvel, even though she lost to Thor in his matchup. So, Nathan, I'm glad you asked about that. We've been doing kind of a mini bracketed tournament here between Megan and I. And uh, we recently had four heroes advance to the second round. Those uh, heroes are Loki, Captain Marvel... <clears throat> Black Widow and Scarlet Witch. So we'll have some head-to-head -head competitions coming up maybe this weekend between those. And uh, my favorite to play so far, I really enjoyed Spider-Man. I had a lot of fun with Spider-Man. Doctor Strange I thought was fun because Doctor Strange doesn't have any upgrades, but he has these spells that he casts. But I think I haven't played Black Widow yet, but I think I would really enjoy Black Widow because I love upgrades. I love the upgrade mechanism in the game. So I think I would have fun playing her. And Black Panther, I had to, oh, Black Panther was a lot of fun to kind of build up, to uh, kind of absorb all this energy and then release it. I thought that was really cool. Loki, uh, surprisingly, I found Loki to be the least enjoyable character for me so far. I like to be sneaky in games, but I found that in a, there was something about playing against Megan in, 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 with Loki versus Thor um, that it just didn't, I, I, I didn't enjoy being sneaky as I thought I would with Loki in this game. Loki does have some really cool sneaky mechanisms involving illusions. Um, but he's probably the one that I look forward to playing again the least, opposed to all these other characters. And I am hoping in round two to play some characters that I haven't played before. Yeah, we have this little little Marvel, Marvel Dice Throne tournament going on. That's fun. In fact, I, it made me want other games uh, that... So it feels a little bit like we're playing through a campaign of the game, but we kind of just create our own structure for it. We said we're playing a tournament of all these characters. And I, I'd be curious to see other, if any other games have that kind of competitive tournament format that feels like uh, a little bit like a campaign. If you can think of any, any other games that do that, let me know. But I, because I've really enjoyed that, that format for this game. All right, it's around lunchtime for me here in St. Louis. So I'm going to take a break for lunch. Thank you for joining me today. Feel free to check out our e-newsletter uh, for any other news that's going on in some of our games. And you can comment on our website if you have any questions. I'll post this video on YouTube too if you have any further follow-up questions there. Thank you. Have a great day, and I will see you next week. Take care. Bye.